Gosh. Over to you, Elise. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. thank you. And thank you so much for having me, Helen. I feel very honored to be in this lineup today. I was like, so, you know, looking at the advertising and seeing my name in there with people like Joe and yourself and Alex, all people that I love and admire. So I'm very happy to be chatting alongside you all today. Um, you've, you've got me fresh out of the ocean. So I um, definitely prioritize my self-care. So it was a cold ocean swim in Sydney today. That's where I am. Um, all righty. So I am going to be chatting to you all about why go grain free. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I am Elise Comerford and I am an integrative nutritionist and GAPS practitioner, and I'm the founder of Well Belly Health Clinic. So it's a um, gut health and GAPS clinic where we see people all over the world and help them with a whole range of gut issues. And I run programs online programs. I run an online program called the Gut Health Formula with Joe. Um, and I recently contributed to Joe's latest cookbook. So all the gut health information, there's a section in there by me, um, which was an absolute honor to be able to do it as well. And if you haven't seen that cookbook, it is amazing. So I'm sure Joe will be showing that to you guys when you get to join her in her kitchen, which is one of my favorite places to be. So why go grain free? Good question. And I'm here to tell you. Um, so we're going to go through a few things today. We're going to talk about what grains are. We're going to talk about why we're eating so much of them, um, how they entered our diet. And we're going to talk about what the issue is. So what the issues is with grains and specifically with gluten um, as well. And what kind of health issues we can see when we have grains too many grains or even grains full stop in our diet. Um, so I will have a little bit of a chat to you guys as well about how, how to start removing grains from your diet. So I'll just cover that briefly. And I'll also have a chat about healing your gut. So if you suspect that you do have gut issues that have resulted from gluten, grain, and a whole lot of other reasons, um, what are some of the first steps you can start taking to heal your gut? So I do have the chat open and I'm really happy to answer questions and I'm happy for you guys to just pop questions in there as I'm going um, and I'll stop and answer them at some points. Um, so yeah, ask away. I'd really love to hear from, from you if you have any questions at all so we can make sure that we cover anything, everything. So we're going to start with basically, yeah, what grains are. So I wasn't going to go into all the science of what a grain is, um, but you'll know grains. They're basically your wheat, oat, barley, rye are your really common gluten grains. And then we have other grains that aren't glutinous. So corn is one that people tend to be unsure about, whether that's a grain or not, and it is. Um, and then on that in that list on the right, we have some of those newer kind of grains, um, the more popular ancient grains. Uh, they're gaining in popularity, those kind of ancient grains. So when we're talking about grains, we're basically talking about these things, um, cereal foods, uh, usually things we make flowers and breads out of if we're not um, making amazing primal alternatives. Um, and they're a large part of the Australian diet. So if we look at the history of human diets, uh, this is a really, really important point um, that grain consumption, it's something it's, that's very, very recent in human history. So if you look at this and you see that uh, just, just like just, just under, it's about 1.9 million years ago that we started cooking with fire. And then we can see all of our dietary shifts have happened in just this very, very small amount of time here. Um, so I've heard it put as, if you looked at all of human existence as a calendar year, then grain consumption started at five minutes to midnight on New Year's Eve. So it's like, you know, right at the end in this very, very, very small period of time that we've been producing and eating grains in the way that we are currently. And if you look at the history of human health, even in our recorded history, so even if we look at the last 100, 150 years, What's been happening with human health? It's been getting worse and worse. So we may have extended our length of life, but we have decreased our quality of life. So things like heart disease, cancer, um, uh, metabolic syndrome, it's all on the rise. 
yet we're meant to have more information than ever. We're meant to know more than we ever did about how to how to care for ourselves as humans. And it's a really it's it's really crazy when you think about it, when you really think about the bigger picture that we are the own we are an animal. And we are the only animal on the planet that is so confused about how to look after themselves. And the reason for that is how interfered our um, dietary choices, how interfered with they have been um, by marketing, product placement, selling, all the things that go into the psychology of how we eat um, and what's available to us. It's so very controlled uh, and made, you know, all our food getting made in factories. So it's um, it's quite it's quite obvious when you do look at the human the history of the human diet and then look at the prevalence of disease and how disease rates have risen that as food became more processed disease became more prevalent it's just as simple as that so it was around the 1920s that cereals and grains really took off and then it was around the 1950s when it when it re- like packaged food and processed food. So around the both the world wars, um, had, you know, that was a big shift for grain production and packaged food production because they needed food that was more stable with shelf life. Um, so we've just seen this drastic rise and then in line with that, the drastic rise in health issues. So it's really not, it's not under question really that we're going and we've been going in the wrong direction with how we take care of our bodies and what we're feeding ourselves and our intake of cereals and grains is a huge part of this because never in the history of human diet have we ever eaten this amount of grain and um, agricultural kind of foods why do we eat so much Unfortunately, money um, has a big lot to do with that. Grains are really cheap. They're very, very easy to transport. Um, The production can be so controlled. They can be grown, um, they're high yield. Uh, It fuels the packaged food industry. So the packaged food industry, there's lots of lots of money to be made there. The more they can have us eating cereal for breakfast, um, you know, cereal bars and snacks and rice cakes for morning tea, sandwiches for lunch, um, crackers, biscuits, things like that for afternoon tea, pasta for dinner. The more they can have us eating these packaged foods, the more money corporations get to make. And who controls our food information? So who controls the what information gets put into our pyramid? Who has the money to do the studies? Um, and who funds the Dietetics Association? It's all um, big sugar companies. And, and packaged food companies. So unfortunately, the way that we learn about food and the way that we learn how to eat and even psychologically how food is sold to us, it's all driven by people that are trying to make money out of us eating more. So we currently eat more. Um, oh, I should remember this stat. It's a good one. But it's something like in 19, compared to 1950, um, that we eat like children eat like 30 percent more than they did back in the 1950s so the it's not just a matter of um some some people think that you know food's just we snack more but still eat the same amount it's not the case more food is being consumed than ever before in human history um so and this is great for packaged food industry they just want us eating more and more food um, and grains are addictive and they actually actually cause like a opioid response in the body um, and drive an addiction. So, yeah, that's basically why we're eating so much of them. We keep being told that they need to be a really big part of our diet, which is not the case. So why go grain free is the big question. It's because we are not designed to eat them. Um, that's basically how it goes. Um, is that the human that humans we're not we can't digest them so we're not designed to eat the, that many grains and digest them properly what's the issue why aren't we meant to eat them so they cause inflammation they cause metabolic problems so when we say metabolic problems like metabolic syndrome is being overweight insulin resistance and high blood pressure it's like all the it's like this trio of factors that make you look really um uh high risk for heart disease, diabetes, and things like that, um, and chronic diseases. So 
there's been, I'm going to, I'll go through this a little bit more and I've got some studies to show, well, just some outcomes of studies to show you as well, that grain and gluten intake has been connected to a lot of these health issues. Um, grains are also sprayed with pesticides, herbicides, lots of other harmful chemicals. So we're not just ingesting the grains, we are also ingesting all of those chemicals that they're sprayed with as well. Um, then there's also, I didn't put this there, but there's also the fact that they're genetic, there's, a lot of them are genetically modified and that, um, uh, what's the term is like franken grains. Um, that yeah, the, the grains we've got now is so different to what was even eaten say a hundred years ago. Grains are designed to actually protect themselves. Most plants have this, that they're protecting themselves from being eaten. And so they actually have anti-nutrients like phytotoxins that protect them. So when you're eating grains, you're also eating all the things that they use to protect them. Funnily enough, whole grains have more of this than do really refined processed grains like white flour. Um, so you think you're doing yourself a real favor when you're eating whole grains, but it's spiking your blood sugar just as much. And it's got all these anti-nutrients in it as well. So even going for your, like, I'll go back here, like the spelt and amaranth, you know, people love spelt because it's, um, lower gluten, it's still a grain and it's still causing issues. So we're still having all of these issues, um, from them as well. So, and there's just the basics that really high carb intake leads to fat accumulation in the liver and pancreas, which leads to insulin resistance, as well as a lot of other health issues. So when I say high carb, if you looked at your diet, um, and if you are eating cereals for breakfast, rice cakes for lunch, uh, morning tea, you know, a sandwich for lunch, it, you know, and it could be on like really good quality sourdough bread, the, the, the cereal could be organic, um, you know, really good quality one. So you could even be eating, choosing high quality, choosing organic, choosing the best that you can. Your carb intake is going to be extremely high. You can have a moderate to low carb intake without even trying, without even really feeling like you're not having to count carbs. Um, and someone's just asked, what's, what is the carb intake recommendation daily? I don't have one because there is no blanket recommendation. And um, if anyone tells you this is a recommended amount, don't believe them because it's different for everybody. So what my recommendation is, is that if you eat whole foods and you cut out grains, you don't have to even think about it. The only way that we're eating so high carb is because we eat so many grains and sugars. So if the grains and sugars weren't there, you wouldn't even have to give it a thought. So you can still have honey, you can still have some fruit, treat fruit like a dessert. Um, you can have all of your veggies and you're eating your meat and your fats and your good whole food. Naturally, it is moderate to low carb um, because the carb levels in these grains is so high. Um, that just by removing them, you're automatically moderate to low carb. So um, I'm really a proponent for eating for nutrition, not calories and macros. Um, so really getting to know your diet viscerally, like how it looks and how it looks across the day, not what it measures. So that's what I'm really about is learning it in that way, because getting like being at a point where you have to count the carbs and everything and really add up what you're having, it creates such a distorted relationship with food. That's no fun. Um, connection to your food, connection with others. That's what's really important. So um, yeah, it's finding that balance between those two things. And I think counting carbs and counting calories and all those kinds of things, it really, it, it just really distorts your relationship with food. Okay, so I wanted to speak more specifically about gluten sensitivity, particularly because there is so much research in this area. And there's also the fact that if you're eating any grains, you're eating gluten because unless you're like getting certified 100% gluten-free grains, there's cross-contamination. There's cross-contamination really in, in anything that's made anywhere near anything that has gluten in it. Um, and when I talk about these issues with gluten, it comes with the cross-contamination, the minuscule amounts as well. Um, so gluten sensitivity is an important one to understand, even if you choose gluten-free or if you eat gluten occasionally, um, that we can still be suffering these issues from gluten. So 
very, very interesting to note is that only around 12% of those who suffer with gluten sensitivity are actually celiac. So there is this idea going around that if it's not celiac, it's not, it's not, there's no such thing. There's not a gluten sensitivity. There is. And so only 12% of celiac, the rest is just gluten sensitivity. Only 1% of celiacs are ever diagnosed. So, so many people are actually celiac and it's never diagnosed, um, which is pretty scary. So gluten is in, used in a huge range of products. It's not just in food. So personal care products, you need to see that it's labeled gluten-free um, or you go and shop on something like Nourished Life um, where you know the quality of what you're actually getting. Um, and then, yes, gluten cr cross-contamination is present in most grain products. So that's something that you need to be really aware of that if you're eating grains, you're probably eating gluten. Um, okay, so... Um, Dr. Alexio Fasano, so he's a highly respected celiac expert and researcher, and, he's, and he says that no human can digest gluten. So even not in the case of gluten sensitivity, he's saying that no human can actually digest gluten. So it's really not good for any of us. Um, and that's because gluten is inflammatory. Um, so it's a factor in a large range of health issues. And that's why I've put this slide here. Um, so it's basically that a study, a, a review paper was done that looked at a lot of different studies and found that 55 diseases were known at that time. So this is 20 years ago um, to be potentially caused by gluten. And then there's a list of all of those issues. So you'll see they range. They're not just digestive issues. You see anxiety, um, ADD, schizophrenia, Hashimoto's. Um, so, you know, issues with your thyroid. Um, and um, neuropathies and neurological disorders. So there is a range there of um, basically gluten in affecting every system of the body because it's causing inflammation and that inflammation affects every part of the body. Um, <clears throat> so, and it's a lot of people who have gluten sensitivity and react to gluten never have a digestive symptom. So it's, there's this idea that it's only digestive symptoms or if you don't get a digestive symptom with gluten or grains, that it's not actually affecting you. Um, and that is absolutely not the case. So eating gluten actually um, can shut down blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. So prefrontal cortex is your, it's like your executive functioning. So it's the decision maker. Um, it helps with focus, managing emotions, planning, organizing your day, basically coping. When you're like, I'm really overwhelmed, I have so much to do, that's your prefrontal cortex going, I can't cope. So um, the inflammation caused by gluten um, can slow, shut down that blood flow to the brain, um, to the prefrontal cortex, and, act, and it activates cells in the brain that can't actually wind down on their own. And it can take a really long time for those cells to actually wind down. Um, so that can lead to long-term damage, neurodegeneration, and over arousal of the nervous system. So just being wi wired. Um, and it's thought that it's about eight out of 10 people with gluten sensitivity have no digestive symptoms, that it can be purely neurological. So if you are having brain fog, um, and finding it's hard to think or remember things or plan or you're getting overwhelmed really easily, it could be a reaction to gluten and grains um, that's going on. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the so gluten sensitivity, it's basically an epidemic now. It's nearly at epidemic stages. Um, and the gluten sensitivity and celiac, so as I said, 12% of um, gluten sensitivity is actually celiac. The rest is just gluten sensitivity. But they are identical when it comes to instance of disease and mortality rates. So whether you're celiac or you're gluten sensitive, those things are the same. You would think being celiac would be worse. Really, outcomes are the same for both. Um, so both cause autoimmune disease and inflammation. And most people suffering from them will never know that they have them, um, which is the scary part. So people that um, you know, might just have some brain fog and then as they go through their life, end up with some liver issues or heart disease or things like that, um, that are actually can be related to gluten and grain intolerance. Um, and as I said, affects all organ systems and your nervous system as well, your mood, cognitive functioning, 
immunological functioning, so how your immune system is functioning, digestive system, musculoskeletal. So it can affect your musculoskeletal system as well. So pretty much everything, um, because in the end, it comes down to inflammation and inflammation affects everything that's going on in our whole system. Okay. Um, I said all of that. Uh, so weight gain is something that we can have going on as well. And leaky gut, that's a really good one. Um, allergies and leaky gut. So gluten can be that um, gateway into more food allergies because gluten actually causes an increase of an enzyme called zonulin in your um, system. And zonulin increases the permeability of your gut lining. So that's letting things through into your blood. Um, and some of those things that are coming through into your blood, proteins that your body is not recognizing as food, um, then it can actually start having an immune response to those things as well. So resulting in more um, allergies, basically. So that, that immune response that's happening from leaky gut. Basically, if you've got leaky gut, you're going to become intolerant to the foods you eat the most. That's really um, as simple as that is. So I just wanted to have a little look here. I like comparing. Um, so here we're going to compare 214 grams of steak to a few slices of whole grain bread. Um, so they have almost the same amount of calories. Um, so in the steak, we've got 250 calories, no simple or complex carbohydrates. It's rich in B vitamins. Um, it's good source of B1. It's good source of um, heme iron, which is our iron from animal foods, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, selenium, and zinc, high in healthy omega fats. It's got our other good fats in it as well. Saturated fats are good for us. Um, and it's also got amazing good quality protein in it too, and a glycemic index of zero. So it means it does not raise your blood sugar levels. Um, if we look at whole grain bread, it has, I just want to skip straight to the glycemic index, 74. It increases your blood sugar more than table sugar does um, the omega-3 to 6 ratio 1 to 23 we want it to be 1 to 1 so one part omega-3 to one part omega-6 the only way we ever have an issue with too many omega-6s in our diets is from eating grains when we eat whole food you never ever have to consider your omega-3 to 6 ratio when you're eating meat veg nuts seeds good quality dairy fish eggs um, those kinds of foods, basically, when we remove the grains and we eat whole foods. So grains are a big reason for this omega ratio to be way out, which is not good for us. Um, so it is a source of these things, um, mostly because it's um, been totally stripped of everything and then refortified. Um, and it's got 207 calories. So we're looking at nearly the same calories as the steak. Um, and we've got this massive, massive spike in blood sugar. So if you think that if you're eating a whole grain cereal, um, rice cakes for morning tea, whole, whole grain bread, sandwich for lunch, some, you know, crackers for afternoon tea, pasta for dinner, your blood sugars are doing this all day long. What does that lead to? Insulin resistance. Um, if you're eating eggs and avocado and some maybe some leftover roast veggies or something fried up in butter for breakfast, Blood sugars, nice and even. And then you won't feel like morning tea because you'll be nice and full. Um, and so then you might have some, you probably won't have lunch either. That's where I'm at. I wouldn't have lunch after that. But if you had lunch, you might have some leftover meat and roast veggies, um, blood sugars, nice and balanced. And then for dinner, it might be meat and veg again. I just gave you an example of a fairly boring day. Um, but you can see such a difference in what these blood sugars are doing and also inflammation. So it's very, very different. And that's where we look at calories in, calories out is not how we look at our health um, because that's just two things with almost the same amount of calories, very, very different. You're going to eat these three slices of bread and you're going to be really hungry really soon. You're going to eat this steak, 240 grams of steak. That's a decent sized steak. You're going to feel really satiated um, and have a lot of nutrition from that. So why avoid grains? Um, I think I've made that fairly clear for you guys. So um, we don't want inflammation. Um, we don't want autoimmune disease. We also don't want to have a leaky gut. Um, and there was always that potential gluten exposure with any grain intake. 
Um, it's going to affect our brain function. We'll feel hungrier and we have spiked blood sugars all day long, up and down, energy up and down. Having your blood sugars all over the place, that's like living in hell. Um, it's really not a good way to be. Um, and it is so, you feel so much better when you make that adjustment and you're not having your blood sugars spiked. Um, and what's important in, in there is when you are eating foods that do have carb, they have the fats. Um, and so that's what's in like in the primal alternative breads. One of my favorites is the fat and seedy bread. Um, it's got the fats in there. And then you have, I have like butter as thick as cheese on there as well. Um, so you want to be getting that, those fats with it. And the difference is just incredible. Um, and I find it completely freeing that it's like you're, you're chained and trapped to food when you are carb addicted. Um, and that is just not a great place to be. Um, so unfortunately, it is all grains. Um, that can cause these issues for us, um, particularly the insulin resistance that, you know, it's all about that high glycemic index and the potential for lots of inflammation as well. Um, and like I said, high intake of carbs leads to fat accumulation in the liver and pancreas, prevents proper insulin secretion um, and increases likelihood of in, um, insulin sensitivity. So that, um, okay, so we'll move along here in the slides. How are we going to go grain free? Um, I like to keep it really simple. So after hearing all of this, you, be, you might be feeling like, oh my goodness, I really want to get grains out of my diet, but where on earth do I start? One thing that we don't want is a whole lot of stress. A whole lot of stress is not going to make you healthier. Um, so you do not need to go stressing yourself out and freaking out in order to remove grains from your diet. Um, so we want to just take things one step at a time, make some simple swaps. So, um, one thing I do a lot with my clients is focus on one meal at a time. So pick one meal could be breakfast and you might think, okay, how can I start going grain free at breakfast? If you have something with toast, that's easy. Get primal alternative bread, um, and make that, it really is that easy. That is what I tell my clients to do. Um, I'm a gaps practitioner. So the, the bread that I get people onto is the fat and seedy one. Um, is my pick and the bagels. I love the bagels as well. Um, so by switching to a bread like that, where um, you can have that simple swap and you're still getting that bread and you can have it with some um, avocado, some poached eggs or something like that. So you can just focus on that one meal at a time. So breakfast might be a good start. People tend to find lunch, lunch is the hardest. So if you start with breakfast and then if you get Joe Witten's Simple Healing Food Book, and you just start making some meals from that. So you might start with one grain-free dinner a week, or you might already do a grain-free dinner without even thinking about it because there's just meat and veg. Um, so you might, um, someone said, is a fat and seedy bread low carb? Yes, it is. Um, and so are the bagels. Um, and there's keto cookies as well. Oh my gosh, the chocolate chip keto cookies. Um, so yeah, oh great. Helen just said one gram of carbs per slice. Yeah, it is really low carb. Um, so yeah, you could look at changing a few dinners and just keep it simple um, so that you are not overwhelming yourself. That's the key here is not to go into overwhelm in order to try to do it. And remember that fats and proteins keep you really satiated. So having lots of fats there is really, really handy. Um, a slice of fat and seedy bread with a big dollop of butter and maybe some peanut butter or something, you know, having something like that on hand is really, really great um, when you can just reach for the thing and you're not having to go and cook yourself something. There's something there that you can just grab. And having the fat and a little bit of sweet together actually really helps to balance out your blood sugar as well. Um, and get the help of a practitioner. So if you're finding that you are struggling, um, if there are little health issues popping up um, and you're not sure what's going on, it's always great to chat to an expert so that they can help you figure out what's actually going on. So if you have had a high grain diet, chances are there is going to be some gut damage. Um, how, we, how do we sort that one out? So we can do short cooked meat stocks. So I've just put a link there. Um, you could just take a photo of that so you can go and find it. Um, and that's the, um, there's a blog post on meat stocks versus bone broth on my blog. 
Um, so that's a really good place to go and read. A lot of you probably make bone broths. I recommend making meat stocks. They are what heal and seal and repair the gut lining. So that blog post will tell you how to do that. Fermented foods are a great one as well. So we want to heal and repair the gut lining. And then we want to be doing lots of fermented foods to get the good bacteria in there, the good enzymes and start changing that microbiome. Um, and we want to remove the foods that are causing harm. So starting to make that, those swaps, replacing our breads, you can still have pizzas, you can still do all of the yummy things when you have the good options. Um, so yeah, starting to make those swaps and find out how you can remove these kinds of foods from your diet that are causing inflammation um, and spiked blood sugars and leading to disease. Also, get help from a practitioner. So if you are having trouble with some gut issues and you're not really sure what's happening there, you need some help, we can help you. Um, so what can you expect from going grain free and sorting out your gut health? Um, weight loss or weight gain really depends what you're needing. Um, we get clients that need either or. Um, improved cardiovascular health, better blood sugar balance, improving autoimmune conditions, enhanced nutrient absorption so i see lots of people that have chronic iron deficiency issues in particular um, less food cravings that is very freeing when you are not controlled by food cravings anymore and better energy levels there's also a whole lot of other things like improved hair skin and nails um, uh, is sleep can improve hormones can balance out um, anxiety and depression issues can get better um, so there's lots of things that you can see improve. Basically, every organ system in your body will be functioning better um, when you're taking care of all of those systems and reducing inflammation. Okay, so I want to tell you guys about something that I have coming up. So starting on the 18th of July, we have our 10-day meat stock challenge. Um, so I love this challenge. And the great thing is it's super cheap to join. We only charge $49 for it um, and it's very, very valuable. So we do 10 days and the only goal is, is to get some meat stock into your diet. So it's not about changing anything else. We don't change anything else in your diet unless you happen to want to. Um, the only goal is, is how can we get any amount in on a daily basis into what you currently eat in any way at all? Um, so the 10 day meat stock challenge, it's really about doing that. We teach you how to make gut healing stocks properly. Um, and then we work together in getting them in. We work a lot with fussy eaters. Um, so in our last challenge, we had lots of fussy eaters in there and some amazing wins in that. If you follow me on Instagram at Elise nutritionist, I did just put some in my story this morning, um, cause I had a question about fussy eating. So I put some of the posts in there from our last program that people had written about their wins with their fussy eaters. Um, so that's, yeah, really amazing. So it's basically gut healing stock is our first step with any client. So this program is about just helping you to get that in, in a really fun and easy way. So everyone doing that last round was just like, oh my gosh, I, like, I am feeling benefits from this. And it was really, really simple. Um, so we do a live Q&A in a Telegram community every day, just for 10 minutes, um, just to answer questions and make sure everyone knows what they're doing. And that's recorded so you can watch it anytime. And there's practitioner support. So we're in there answering questions. So loads and loads of value for $49. Um, so that you can head to worldbellyhealth.com.au slash 10 days for 10 days gut healing. And if you are needing the help of a practitioner, these are the ways you can connect with the clinic and with myself. We do do free 20 minute consultations. We do packages and online programs. I have an online program that I do with Joe called the Gut Health Formula. The, this round's already started, but there'll be another round starting in September. Um, so we have been doing that for four years now. So we've helped thousands of people with that program. I'm going to scroll back through some questions. Um, I've heard that if we go grain free, we are reducing the good gut bugs. Not sure which way is right, not wanting to do further harm to my gut. Absolutely not the case at all. Um, so when you go grain free, you eat lots of veggies and you'll eat lots of fermented foods. Your gut bugs will be very happy and they don't want to be in, 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 in an inflamed environment. So that is absolutely not the case. Um, I was having debilitating panic attacks, anxiety for years without digestive issues. And it wasn't until I started having digestive issues that I tested positive for celiacs. And once going gluten-free, I've not had a panic attack since. That's amazing. So um, I'm so happy to hear you haven't had that issue again. 
And that's a case where the neurological is what was prevalent and it took a while for digestive symptoms to kick in. So there's going to be people out there that are having anxiety and issues like that, that is gluten related or grain related um, and they don't know it. So of course, there's other reasons for those things as well, um, but there will be a lot of people who it is related to grains and gluten. Um, my son won't eat meat or veg. What do I feed him? Sarah, I would suggest booking in my clinic. We work a lot with fussy eaters um, and I would be wanting to get onto that sooner rather than later. Um, and it, if fussy eating and food choices, it isn't about, I don't like that food. It is actually about what's going on in the microbiome in the mouth, in the gut, nutrient deficiencies that, deficiencies that lead to that as well. There's a lot more going on there and you've really, it's a good time to address it. Um, what about replacing the fiber that oats for breakfast gives? We get fiber from vegetables. Vegetables are a fantastic source of fiber and the kind of fiber that our body can actually process and digest and move out properly. Um, so we do not need fiber from grains. It's absolutely false um, that we need that and humans have survived millennia without it. Um, and we had the fat and seedy bread question. Um, had the fat and seedy bagels for breakfast this morning with avo and tomatoes from the garden. So yummy. I know they are. They're probably my favorite, the fat and seedy bagels. Um, someone else did too. Uh, what's the longest cook time you should do for a short cooked meat stock? Um, so chicken, I do two to three hours, lamb, four hours, beef, six to eight hours. Um, so yeah, they're, um, that's the gut healing stocks. Um, and Rosalind said she's vegetarian. So we won't be seeing Rosalind in the 10 day meat stock challenge, which is okay. <laughs> um, all righty. Does anybody else have any questions for me? Well, it's so lovely to chat to you guys. We still got, there's Helen. Elise, Elise, that was so fantastic. My goodness. So, so good. Thank you. How do you keep all that information in your head? I just, I love, I'm so passionate about it. I don't know. That's always been, um, I think a part of my skill is I can retain a lot of information. It's because I don't eat grains. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I'm sure that has to be the reason, but I love it. It gets, as, as you can see, as I'm talking, it gets me really excited mm. um, because there'll be people that are listening right now that are eating grains that really take this on and are going to go and change something. And then I know that on my Saturday, I've impacted some people's lives that they might go and start removing some grains and feel a lot better and be like, oh, wow, that really helped. And so that makes me very, very excited. So good. And that list that you had of um, all the things that grains do to you, I, I'm going to be sharing my story later. And I'm like, wow, that was me. That was the whole list. Yeah, it was me too. Yeah, definitely. I think we've got a few more questions. Oh, no, we've just got, thank you for sharing your knowledge. So great to hear from you. Oh, uh, Peter Bell says, if you're a vegetarian, what's good for your gut health? I'll let you answer that one. I yeah, I am an, an omnivorous nutritionist. So um, all the advice I give is based on animal foods and unpopular opinion for some, but I really believe that we need animal foods in our diet. So um, that's kind of the angle that I come from. But I would say definitely removing grains, removing refined vegetable oils and processed sugars. So if you're eating a really good quality whole food vegetarian diet, it's going to be so much better for your gut. Awesome. Any final questions, guys, before we wrap up with the excellent Elise? Was it warm in the ocean this morning? You're very brave going for a no. swim. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I really needed to wake up this morning. And I was like, I'm sure Helen won't mind if I arrive with wet hair. Oh, I expected nothing less. You've always got this, like, just come out of the beach or being on the beach or being dancing somewhere. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Awesome. All right. Any final words, Elise, before we wrap up? I just love what you're doing, Helen. I was raving about you to my friends this morning and I just love the, I love Primal Alternative and just the fact that you're just getting this out there and not only 
the health message, but also empowering mums to have a business and be able to do something that's meaningful and passionate from home. So um, I have a primal lista that works in my clinic, actually. Um, oh, really? My, my admin. Yeah. Did oh, you not know so that? Cool. No. Who's that? Sheree. Oh, cool. our admin superstar. So Sheree's loving life at the moment because she works for our clinic. Um, she does Primalista and she started a bulk food business called Greenlight Green, Pantry. Yeah, um, she's doing so well. She's just like living the dream at the moment, getting to work in all these businesses that she's really passionate about and she's just a star. It's so cool. Yeah, I love it. I, I do love the little model because, it, you know, it's like if you don't want to you know, go to uni and remember all that stuff that you have to remember <laughs> or like come yeah. up with an amazing blog like Joe or an amazing platform like Low Tox Life, but you still want to be, you know, in the in the industry and helping people, then it's a it's a nice model to do that kind of thing with. Yeah, um, so thanks absolutely. for mentioning that. There's a couple of final, uh, the old uh, quinoa uh, and buckwheat. Quinoa, buckwheat, they're pseudo grains. Um, so they're not grains, they are grain-like seeds, um, but they are high starch. So they're not something I suggest having a lot of in your diet. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as concerned about them as other grains, but I wouldn't eat them daily. I wouldn't even eat them more than once a week. Um, they're, they're high starch. So everything I was talking about with, um, spiking blood sugar levels and, um, you know, high carbs causing um, uh, fat deposits in the liver and pancreas and all those kinds of issues that comes with all your really high starch stuff as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elise. We are going to take a little break now and then we will be back in about 10 minutes with the marvelous Jo Witten in her kitchen. I just saw on her Insta story, she's been roasting some fruit. So, hmm. Wonder what she's going to be making with that. There, I love, I love being in her kitchen. I love going and just sit, you just sit yourself at the bench, and then she's just like, I've got this in the freezer and this, and just like places all the things in front of you and all these little tasters. Yeah, it's great. Oh, you're so lucky. I've never been in Joe's kitchen. Um, oh, you need to. But maybe one day, maybe one day I'll get there. But I would love to do that. All right, so guys, go and grab yourself a lovely cup of healing stock or a nice glass of mineral water or have a toilet break and we will be back in about 10 minutes thank you again elise so much you're such a legend uh, such an honor to have you here thank you for your time and your knowledge uh, incredible thank you bye everybody. be back soon